When the organizers asked me to speak about the Great Depression, I followed U.S. history, uh, which is that the first Great Depression was the Panic of 1873, and then the Panic of 1893 came along, so that was called the Great Depression, and then the Great Depression came. So when they said the Great Depression, I interpreted that to mean 2007, 2008. So I'm going to talk about that Great Depression. Uh, this is a preliminary empirical paper. It has the goal of trying to understand what exactly we mean by a financial crisis, uh, and, and you know what, what what is a financial crisis, and we're going to look at that in the context of trying to understand why the failure of Lehman Brothers seemed to make everything so much worse. Now, there's a standard view out there. Uh, a few people uh, actually said this in print. Many people will tell you this. Uh, and that is that there were two shocks. I call this the two-shock view of the world. And the two-shock view says that there was a subprime shock, and if that's all that happened, we wouldn't have had a lot of problems. There would have been a recession. But then there was Lehman. And all the people who said that we had to punish somebody for moral hazard reasons, then all those people said that Lehman was a mistake. So this, this, is, this is a real problem, I think, for economists, because a shock is not an explanation of anything. Uh, it makes it seem like it's a natural event. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at as much data as we can find, and, and we're going to try to argue that, that a crisis is a process. It's a process before the crisis, which is a credit boom. And then during the crisis, it's not as if nothing happens. So between these two events, which uh, there's going to be things, things that happen. Uh, and in particular, we're going to test uh, at least one prediction of a model. Uh, and we're going to do that by um, uh, uh, determining an exact chronology of the crisis. OK, so what are money market instruments? We're going to look at secured money market instruments. Uh, repo is, one, is the only secured uh, uh, category. General collateral repo is repo backed by treasuries, and then there's repo backed by privately created bonds. And then there's unsecured money market instruments, which are commercial paper, asset-backed commercial paper, Fed funds, and LIBOR. These instruments, you're not actually given collateral when you lend, uh, but the, the entities that can issue in this market are very carefully screened. Uh, there's very few non-financial firms that issue commercial paper, but uh, financial firms issue commercial paper, but you can't issue unless you're very highly rated. Uh, Asset-backed commercial paper uh, is only issued by conduits that have very circumscribed uh, investment categories. And of course, Fed funds and LIBOR are banks that are overseen by various regulators. So what's going to happen, these are money market instruments, so this is essentially money for non-households. And when the moneyness of this money is questioned, and, and this, this refers to some theory work with uh, Dang and Holmstrom, then this, this, this moneyness can be recreated by tightening the screening of issuers, in the case of unsecured, uh, by higher haircuts, uh, in the case of repo, or better collateral, in the case of repo, or shorter maturities. So we can't, of these, we can't directly see uh, uh, much of this, but we're going to be able to say uh, quite a bit about this. So um, the, the paper presents a model, a little model. Uh, let me just summarize it. Uh, imagine that we're just entering the crisis. Then most money market spreads are going to increase, uh, but not all of them. Uh, general collateral repo is going to go down, and so are some of the others. So the first thing we should see is an increase in sp uh, price uh, spreads. Then, then there's this very important issue, which is that borrowers uh, want to lend long because they want to uh, lock in funding. And the lenders, however, uh, don't want to lend long. They only want to lend short because they want the option to exit. So the model uh, uh, explains all that. And one implication of that is that uh, maturity shortened, but in, in more specifically, the term structure of spreads is going to be upward sloping. So normally, this term structure of spreads is flat. And I'll show you that in the data. And then it's going to become uh, steeper and steeper to the extent that these borrowers and lenders have some desperation in their, their desires to have the option to exit or to lock in uh, loans. Banks, during the crisis, 
uh, from the beginning, want to avoid having to sell assets. Nobody's going to lend to them. Nobody's going to buy their equity. We run out of sovereign wealth funds fairly quickly. So they don't want to sell at fire sale prices. So they don't want haircuts to rise, and they don't want their commercial paper to not roll. So haircuts, uh, the thing we can observe, would be the last thing that happens. Right? First, first, you fight over maturity, and it, it, if you have to, then haircuts are going to rise. So these dynamics are going to be repeated. And the way you want to think of this is, as the maturity gets tighter and tighter, uh, and they substitute better and better collateral, just the way to think of it is the forest is getting drier and drier and drier. And as it gets drier, then Lehman happens. So that's what I mean about testing, uh, testing uh, the chronology. So we're going to look at spreads. Uh, these are the annualized rates on these different instruments. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, the, the rate um, uh, spread to, in most of this, Fed funds, target Fed funds. Uh, actual Fed funds moves all over the place and deviates more and more from the target during the crisis. If we uh, took the rate uh, spread to the overnight index swap rate, all these pictures and results would be the same. So nothing really depends on that. Okay, so here's the spreads before the crisis. So along the uh, x-axis, you see the different categories of money, uh, lots of secured repo, and then uh, there's LIBOR, various categories of commercial paper. Now, you can see the bars that are the highest are uh, the one to the right that says unpriced ABS. This is astounding that this was ever collateral for repo. This means you can't find a price for it. Uh, and then there's uh, the other large bar is uh, asset-backed securities that are rated less than double A. So aside from those, you can see that everything is uh, uh, about five basis points or less, right? So this, 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 these, these money market instruments are trading basically within arbitrage bounds. And remember that there's only a few institutions, uh, uh, very large banks uh, in the US that can operate in all these markets, right? You have to be able to operate in Fed funds, asset-backed commercial paper, uh, repo, LIBOR, uh, so those are basically large, large American banks. So before the crisis meets prior to the date, which I'm going to show you that repo spreads increased. And the reason the scale is so high is because I'm going to show you now what happens uh, on average during the crisis. So this is averaged over the, the crisis, so of course these, it doesn't show you the incremental steps that they increased, I'll show you that in a minute, but it shows you that these these spreads uh, shoot up because it's a systemic event. Uh, it can't be. It can't be hedged. Okay, so here, here's the time series of this, uh, and you can you can basically see what's happening. And, and the left uh, is normal times, and aside from some uh, weird seasonals, it's pretty flat near zero. And then the first date where there's a break in, in repo spreads, and I'll show you how that's dated in a minute. You can see it goes up and it becomes more volatile. And then there's the second break. And the second break is before Lehman, right? before Lehman. And then Lehman is going to happen, uh, is going to happen even later. So how, how we do we determine these breakpoints? So uh, we, use, we use a method from uh, Jushan Bai. It basically allows you to uh, find breakpoints, unknown breakpoints in panel data. So the, the, uh, this, this, this procedure allows the means and the variance of time series to vary, and if there's a break in either the mean or the variance, then uh, uh, it will indicate a break. And, and this can, in fact, uh, be done on very small panels, a panel of one. But the, the, the power of this is that you're, you're, in a sense, borrowing power from the cross-section, so that even if the, the break occurs towards the very end of the time series, since the power of this test is coming from the cross-section, you don't need to worry about these endpoint problems. So the other thing is, once we find the breakpoint, then we can confirm for each series, in fact, it turns out, that a standard Chow test uh, shows a break. So this, this, this by procedure uh, is testing against the alternative of no change. Right? There are econometric procedures that test for gradual change, although not yet on panels. But there's nothing here about whether the change is gradual or sudden. Right? We have no power against that anyway. So we're identifying uh, the date that there's a change. It may have happened gradually. It may have happened suddenly. OK, so we're going to apply that to these uh, panels that correspond to these five categories. We're going to have a uh, panel series for the real economy, for subprime, for financial firms, for the unsecured money markets, and for the secured money markets. Um, and here they are. So for example, 
The real sector is the VIX, the S&P 500, JP Morgan High Yield Index, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Dow Jones uh, Credit Derivative Index for investment grade firms. So remember, we're, we're using daily data here, so we can't use you know, un unemployment or something, right? We're going to use uh, prices. Subprime is uh, ABX tranches, which did not move together, and, uh, and, and subprime loans, which are uh, high uh, home equity loans. For the financial firms, we have CDS, daily CDS, and then we have all this stuff on interbank markets and, and repo categories. So, so we apply this, and here's, here's uh, the first set of uh, kind of overall, uh, kind of, I'm going to show you more detailed uh, results in a minute, but here's the first set of breakpoints for each of these series. So the first thing to notice is the top line. So when did the crisis start? It's kind of consistent with what we all thought. Uh, it started in the first quarter of 2007, January 4th. Now notice on the right-hand side there's the 99% confidence intervals stated in terms of dates. Okay? So you can see this, this, we have a lot of data, daily data, pins it down fairly precisely. So the crisis starts, there's problems in subprime, then when time goes by, and the next thing that happens is spreads in repo uh, go up, and that happens in Ju on July 23rd, 2007. And that's, you know, when that happens, it's telling you that the, the, the borrowers now have an issue because they have to pay a lot more money, so it's not surprising that the financial market CDS <coughs> also shows a break on the same date. Okay. The unsecured instruments happen in August, and then the real effects don't happen until January 2008. Okay, so you, you can tease this in various ways. For example, if you just look at asset-backed commercial paper, that, the spreads don't really go up. What happens is the sponsors take that stuff back, all back on balance sheet, and then they have to finance it in the repo market. So it all ends up showing up in the repo market. Okay. So this is the first set of breakpoints. So the buy procedure, you take this panel, it goes from this date to this date, and you find the first breakpoint. Then you can search on each side of that breakpoint for the second breakpoint, okay, chronologically. So we find the next breakpoints are all subsequent to these dates. Right? It doesn't have to be that way, it turns out to be that way. So these second uh, breakpoints we're gonna determine. So, uh, Jushan Bai, we spent a lot of time with Professor Bai, and there's no way yet of sort of deciding when you're going to run out of breakpoints. In principle, you just go on with breakpoints, and uh, maybe the, what's going to happen is the standard errors are going to go up. We're just going to look for three and stop there. Okay, so here's, here's the overall set of results just for spreads. We haven't talked about uh, the term structure yet, or maturities, or haircuts. Just, we're just looking at spreads. So you can see uh, the top line is what is where we started. July 23rd, we see repo, then we see asset-backed commercial paper, uh, unsecured money market instruments, and then finally in August, this is all happening very quickly, uh, general collateral repo as a, as a structural break. In, in, in this case, it goes negative, right? The break is that, that everybody wants treasuries, and so you don't have to pay anything uh, uh, for treasuries. Then there's, then there's a bit of a pause, and then, there's a second break in repo, August, a year later, 2008, uh, the other money market instruments occur, and all that's happening before Lehman, before Lehman, right? So this period before Lehman is what we're really interested in, right? We don't find, you know, the, the, the two shock view says you should have that first up on the top line and nothing should happen until Lehman. But what I want to point out is that these, these shocks on the left of the 2008 line happen before Lehman. And we're going to see that that's true of, of many of the other series as well. And then Lehman fails, and we have sort of the aftermath of Lehman. OK. So the flight for maturity refers to this shortening of maturity. And we only have issuance data uh, by maturity for commercial paper. And th there's a problem with that, because the mix of who's borrowing in this market is changing. If you look in the, pa in the paper, we, we show that the mix is changing. So the low quality borrowers uh, low quality endogenous here are being forced out of the market, and only the high quality uh, borrowers can stay in the market. But nevertheless, we're going to look at that data. And then we're going to look at this, um, this term structure of spreads. Right? So remember, it's not the term structure, it's the term structure of spreads. Right? So in normal times, we're, we're going to verify that this term structure is flat, and then we can, we can get a glimpse of this desperate struggle between borrowers and lenders where borrowers want to borrow long, they're offering, offering a higher rate 
a higher spread for long, and long here is going to be like a month. Uh, uh, and the, and the, the lenders only want to lend short. So the borrowers say, we don't have to pay you anything for short, but we want to entice you to lend long, so the, the term structure is going, to, is going to increase. OK, so let's, let's uh, just start by looking at the, uh, um, the uh, asset-backed commercial paper. So asset-backed commercial paper, I'll show you where the breakpoints are in a minute. It turns out there are breakpoints in this. This, is, this divides the, all the various maturities into uh, short maturity and long maturity and looks at the ratio. Okay. So uh, you can see that there's a sort of a step function around uh, August 2007. So from the beginning until August, it's kind of flat. And then there's this one, there's this one uh, step up right, right here. And then it goes like this, and here's, and here's lean. Okay. Now, one, one way to sort of think about what's going on is just to uh, contrast this with the second line. And the second line is this, uh, by now, well-known measure of counterparty risk, which is the LIBOR OIS spread. So that's, that tells you how risky counterparties perceive each other, right? And to the extent that the, the, the counterparties are thinking of them as riskier, you see that the maturity of, of commercial paper. By the way, this is all financial firm commercial paper uh, for the most part. So, so that's, what's, that's what's going on. Now, the, the term structure spreads. These, these, these maturities are endogenous if you want to create money. You can't create money out of 10-year instruments, right? So, so the market has, has limits on how long uh, the maturity of these instruments are. You can borrow in the repo market for longer if your collateral is better, for example. But commercial paper is really thin past like three weeks. So, so what, what the... What the maturities are is, is, is endogenous. And then, um, as I said, this term structure is going to sleep, uh, steepen. So here's an example. All the pictures look the same. Here's the LIBOR market. You can see on the bottom is before the crisis. Right? So the term structure is flat. So these court in the next two lines, red and green, correspond to the two break, first two breakpoints. So you can see what's happening. What's happening is that as the crisis goes on, this term structure is, uh, of spreads is steepening and steepening. Right? And it's also true uh, for, for everything. But here's uh, the asset-backed commercial paper. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, repo backed by asset-backed securities rated less than double A. Right. So again, you can see that before the crisis, this term structure is flat, and then it steepens at each of these breakpoints. So, you know, of course, we would like to have data on actual collateral and actual maturities in these markets. We don't have that. So we have, we have uh, just a glimpse of what's happening by these term structures steepening. Now, so I would say the main prediction of the model is that um, uh, haircuts increase last. So uh, the first break point in haircuts, and I'm going to show you this on a picture in a minute, uh, happens uh, not, remember, everything else is happening in July and August. And it's not until uh, October that there's the first break point in repo. Right. And then uh, there comes the second break point. And then the third break point is coincident, is coincident with, um, with Lehman. So here's a picture of it. So here, the, the, um, this is time is along the bottom. Uh, the haircuts in percentage term are on the y-axis. And the red dotted line is subprime related collateral, which goes to 100%. It's no good as collateral anymore. Uh, and then you have non subprime related collateral. Um, and then you have the average. So the breakpoints in the data sort of make sense. Here's the first breakpoint. Here's the second breakpoint. And the third breakpoint is consistent with Lehman. It's on the same date as Lehman. So again, the, 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 there's two things to take away from this picture. One is that haircuts in the beginning happen after you get the, the increase in spreads and after you get the increase <coughs> in uh, uh, the slope of the term structure of spreads. But then all that happens again before Lehman. And then, and then in terms of haircuts, everybody runs on the date of Lehman. So here, here's, a, here's a summary of, of everything. Uh, this is uh, starting with a subprime shock. You saw this before in January. Then the next thing that happens is a direct measure of the shortening of maturity. Even though the mix of lenders is changing, still the maturity starts to shorten. And this is consistent with anecdotal evidence, right? I mean, if you ask, 
you know, the president of Bayer at the time, Alan Schwartz, you know, why did you have so much overnight repo? And he said, well, we didn't, we used to. The market wouldn't lend to us term. So it's, 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 it got shorter and shorter as time went on through 2007. Then in red uh, is the first uh, response in the money market. You get the shock to repo spreads. At the same time, the, the slope of repo starts to steepen. And, and financial firms uh, uh, suddenly are viewed as more risky. That's followed by the unsecured instruments. Then we get uh, the second set. Uh, th then we get finally we get repo haircuts going up for the first time in the 23rd. And then there's the real effects. So one might argue that this this page has to do with the subprime shock, which started in January. Right. So the it's not even a theory, but the I don't know what you want to call it, story or whatever it is about two shocks. Um, uh, would say that nothing happens until Lehman. So that's this period that I put in the red bracket, right? This is, this is what's going on before Lehman, right? So again, you have the, ter the spreads in repo show a spike or uh, change. <coughs> Term structure again uh, steepens. Then you have uh, repo haircuts again. And then you have uh, shortening of terms, the term structure of money market instruments. So the part in red brackets is the forest getting drier and drier. This is all happening before Lehman, right? Unbeknownst to anyone, in, you know, like the Fed. And then, and then you get Lehman. Then you get Lehman. Uh, so Lehman uh, is, then, is then is followed by these by uh, further further breaks. Okay, so a financial crisis is not a shock. Uh, it's a kind of an unhelpful expression. Uh, in a, other work with Guillermo Ordonez, we look at uh, the, the preceding credit boom. So we hold the shock constant. And the effect of a shock depends on how long the credit boom has been going on. So Christ is not a big shock. So if, if you think about models like Kiyotaki Moore or uh, Bernanke uh, uh, Gertler, these are models that, you know, to get a big effect, you have to have a big shock. So this is like big shock theories. So why there was a big shock, we don't know. Uh, so, so in this paper, uh, again, it's not, it's not that Lehman was a big shock. It was in, in, in context, in a particular context, right? So there was this endogenous buildup of fragility going on, right? It's this, it's this process, and, and the end result of that is that we get Lehman. 